Hey, everybody. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Can We Please Talk podcast. As always, I am your host, Mike Leon. My co-host, Nick Savary, is not here. He's out in Ocean City right now, smashing crabs, or at least attempting to smash crabs at a dinner table somewhere. We miss him, but I've brought in the Calvary. I've brought in some backup with me. Friends of the podcast, first former uh, advisor to Secretary Kerry. She's a Fox News contributor, my buddy Marie Harf. Marie, thank you for hopping on the podcast with us. Oh, I'm so happy to be on. The election season is underway. Let's That's right. It. That's right. You've been texting me. It's like a Super Bowl, right, for, <laughs> for everybody watching this. And then fighting out of the red corner, the proverbial red corner. Uh, <laughs> she's a former press advisor uh, to House Speaker John Boehner. She obviously deputy chief of staff for Representative Adam Kinzinger, another friend of the pod, Maura Gillespie. Maura, welcome into the program. Thanks for having me. Glad to be with you both. Yeah. You know, this is great because, well, first off, I have no Nick. Um, that's first. I know. Second, how did Nick get to go on vacation? I'm just, like, how did that happen? Mike? I, I told him, I said, listen, you got to plan around <laughs> August 23rd. It's the primary debate. And we're going to get into a bunch because I, I know he's going to be chomping at the bit in terms of some of the things that we heard tonight, some of the pushback, some of the back and forth between some of the candidates. First, let me start with you, Marie. Um, what do you take overall from the night introductions, uh, the eight candidates that were out there on the stage? What are some things that kind of stood out with you from the debate? Well, first, Ron DeSantis, you know, the number two to Donald Trump, I don't think looked really great during the debate. He looked wooden. He had rehearsed answers. He looked really angry and sort of like a fired up. I don't know, like there, it was very, it almost looked very forced and very fake. So a lot of us were looking at DeSantis to see if he could pick up the mantle of Trump. And I don't think he did well. Look, Vivek has a big following. You could hear it in that crowd, but he's sort of a caricature and said, so we'll say anything to get people to clap for him. But the biggest takeaway is the first, you know, hour, basically the whole first part of the debate, they barely touched Donald Trump. And so if this was a, a, a debate to show who could actually be the alternative to Trump, who could be a better general election candidate, they didn't lay a glove on him. And many people won't watch the whole debate, right? They're not like us. They're not political junkies. They'll watch the intros. They'll watch the first half hour. And Donald Trump's name was barely spoken, which I think is pretty odd for people running against him. Yeah, no, very well said. And it, we're going to get into the former president doing something, a pre-taped interview with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson separately and what that means for him in Iowa. More, let me turn to you. Uh, what were some of your takeaways on the night, some of the back and forth, some of the answers Nikki Haley gave on some pressing issues I thought was pretty interesting? What would you make of the night overall? I think Nikki Haley came out swinging and she was strong, prepared, very polished, uh, I, I think she really knocked out of the park on several of her answers. And I know, we'll, you know, we can talk about them in more depth, but uh, just larger takeaways. I do think that Tim Scott came out a little flat. I think Chris Christie started out a little flat and then picked up some steam there and really put a couple of them in their place, especially Vivek. Um, he, to me, came across as super smarmy and just attention seeking and basically a Trump junior uh, looking to just... Yeah, like Marie, like you said, just get the claps where he could and just, again, looking for the attention, which obviously is what Donald Trump seeks to do. It is interesting that the candidates, you know, didn't want to have Trump take out all the oxygen in the room, uh, but it still needs to be hit on. And and it's a shame that they didn't really focus on, you know, the, the indictments. I mean, obviously, he's going to be turning himself in tomorrow. So, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. I mean, and you know what? As they were talking a little bit about it. There was some back and forth between Governor Chris Christie and Vivek Ramazani. We're going to get into a bunch of it in a sec. I want to stay on what you just mentioned about a guy who I said in our last episode, as we were previewing tonight's debate, I told Nick, and, and Nick is Indian, so he said that the cookout invite is no longer extended for Vivek. But he, to me, is, I was telling you this, Marie, off air, he is very TED Talk guy, right? Very 25 mm -hmm. minutes later, you don't know if you're buying an Apple watch or you just heard something that, you know, is nonsensical. I want to play a little bit of what Brett Baer asked him at the beginning of this debate, because it, it made a lot of sense where people are like, you are an outsider here. You're an entrepreneur. You've never worked in government. You said you barely even voted. Take a listen to this. Why should voters choose you over more experienced politicians on this stage? Uh, you're basically, you know, a blank slate for people. You're 38 years old. Uh, you've said that you only voted in two presidential elections before this moment, this political race. So first, let me just address a question that is on everybody's mind at home tonight. 
who the heck is this skinny guy with a funny last name and what the heck is he doing in the middle of this debate stage? I'll tell you, I'm not a politician, Brett. You're right about that. I'm an entrepreneur. My parents came to this country with no money 40 years ago. I have gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while marrying my wife, Apoorva, raising our two sons, following our faith in God. That is the American dream. And I am genuinely worried that that American dream will not exist for our two sons and their generation unless we do something about it. And I do think Brett is going to take an outsider because for a long time we have professional politicians in the Republican Party who have been running from something. Now is our moment to start running to something, to our vision of what it means to be an American today. If you have a broken car, you don't turn over the keys to the people who broke it again. You hand it over to a new generation to actually fix the problem. That's why I'm in this race and we're just getting warmed up. So, Marie, you heard the answer there. We all kind of made some smirks as that was playing and some <laughs> eye rolls were made by maybe six eyeballs here on this uh, Zoom chat. What do you make of Vivek's candidacy, how he's right now in third place, according to a bunch of different polls behind Governor DeSantis, but... His answer overall, right, and we're going to play a little bit of the pushback that Vice President Pence said to him about his inexperience in government. What would you make of his response there and, and how he comes off so charismatic on television? He does. Look, he was probably the most uh, energetic, sort of charismatic candidate on that debate stage. I think the crowd loved him. He's very good at this. I mean, in some ways, he is very Trump-like. I, I did notice, and Christy came back at him on this, when he said he's a skinny guy with a funny name, I worked for Barack Obama. And as soon as he said that, I was like, someone has to call him out on that, man. That's Barack Obama's line. Um, but he he's very charismatic. He's doing every interview under the sun. He will talk to anyone, uh, go on any you know TV show he's asked on. And he is rising in the polls, I think, because he's an outsider, because he's something fresh and new. And I think there is a lot of um, desire for someone who's not establishment. Right. And he represents that. I'm just not sure he has lasting power. And and when you look at some of the other candidates on the stage, though, I don't think any of them took him down. I think Ron DeSantis was supposed to be the man in charge, the, the heir apparent to Trump. And he just kind of looked weird. Right. So Vivek, I think, actually had a pretty good night, even though he said some insane things like climate change is a hoax. So he says crazy things. But he says it very well. Sounds like someone else we knew on the Republican debate stage not that long ago. Yeah, very well said. Uh, Maura, I want to turn to you because you you mentioned before how he comes off a little swarmy. What do you make of his response to Brett? What do you make of his ascension so far in the polls? I think I saw something recently, a Fox News poll that had him and Trump in terms of Republicans that will listen to somebody like throughout the entirety of their speech. And he was like second to only Donald Trump. You heard his response there. You heard the cheers of what he said. What do you make of it as somebody who's been a strategist on that side of the aisle? For someone who has said his whole campaign about being about the truth, the truth, the truth. It's fascinating to me that he one has been called out for lying uh, most recently on CNN with his interview with Caitlin Collins and his interview with the Atlantic. And yet he continues to say they took it out of context. There's no, there's nothing there to take out of context, but yet he's going to continue to double down just like Donald Trump on his lies. So I find it very interesting that he has a campaign based on truth and then contradicts himself left, right, and center. And then second to that, you know, when he's on the stage complaining about how people have all their canned responses and they're bought and paid for and all these things. He took a line from Barack Obama that he had practiced in the mirror and then continued on to talk about his wife and his children with his canned responses. So I honestly find him, I'll be very, very blunt. I found him incredibly smarmy and annoying and was just, uh, honestly, he, it, it was hard to watch him. Honestly, yeah. it was hard to watch him. He, maybe he comes across for some people as charismatic. I found him quite annoying and ill-informed. He is not prepared, does not know what he's talking about. He is not equipped on these issues and it would be terrifying for him to go any farther in this race than pass this debate. As somebody who tries to be charming, uh, I will say that, uh, <laughs> speaking for my buddy Vivek, uh, uh, we apologize out there for being swarmy if we come off swarmy. Um, I want to play I want to play some more sound because you guys were touching on it. The climate change is a hoax. 
Uh, Vivek had an exchange with a former vice president, Mike Pence, where he kind of said something but didn't understand it. And Pence gave the old government establishment answer. I want to play this for you guys and get your reaction. Take a listen to this. I'm not sure I exactly understood Mike Pence's comment, but I'll let you all parse that out. For me, it's pretty simple. That's something a U.S. president can do with focus, and I'll deliver on it. Let me explain it to you. Let me explain it to you, Vivek, if I can. I'll go slower this time. I, you know, I, I sometimes struggle with the reading comprehension. Look, I was, uh, right I was a House conservative <laughs> leader before it was cool. I actually pushed a deficit reduction act that was the last time we actually reduced the national debt in the United States when I was the leader of House conservatives. I balanced budgets and cut taxes when I was governor. I mean, look, Joe Biden has weakened this country at home and abroad. Now is not the time for on-the-job training. We don't need to bring in a rookie. We don't need to bring in people without experience. All right, Marie, in a normal world, a vice president, let's say, I don't know, Joe Biden would be leading in these polls because they have the experience of coming off of a successful administration. Here we have Vice President Pence pushing back on the entrepreneur with no government experience. What do you make first off of the exchange? But then also Pence so far has been in the low one percent, maybe two percent, according to some polls. Uh, he doesn't seem to be gaining traction. And it looked like at times during this debate when he would get pushed back by Nikki Haley, by Vivek. He was struggling and he was giving the same boring, mundane responses. And a lot of people in that room are looking for an energetic, upbeat response, it seemed like. And they would cheer when Vivek would give an answer. What do you make of the exchange? And then what do you what do you make of Pence's candidacy so far and how he's doing in this race? Well, I do think that Vivek is not qualified. I don't think he has any relevant experience. So I, I guess I agree with Chris Christie and Mike Pence on that. Pence is interesting, though, because he's never been a great retail politician. He's, I, I guess, no, I've heard stories about when he was a radio host or when he was in Congress that he was much better at this sort of retail politics. But as long as I've seen him on the national stage, he's been pretty wooden, right? This is what he was like as vice president. He brought the evangelical vote to Trump. He did his job, but he's never been, you know, a fire and brimstone national politician. This is the Mike Pence we all know. I think a lot of people feel very strongly that he was quite courageous on January 6th and since then talking about it. But when you get on that debate stage, and you're talking about tax cuts and, you know, all the bread and butter issues, abortion for a Republican primary, he reverts to the establishment politician. So I think he has a better shot in Iowa. He spent a lot of time there as a state that's really tailored for his kind of politics. He's from the state, you know, right next door. But I think Mike Pence's time on the national stage has passed. I think. I could be wrong, but I think. Well, we're going to find out, see how people feel after this uh, when they get to the voting. Um, more, let me ask you also on that exchange, but Pence's candidacy overall, what do you make of all of it? I think he's right to call Vivek out and to, again, highlight his leadership, his experience as vice president, but as governor, as a congressman, as leader of the NR, you know, he was leading the conference, at, you know, years and years ago. But I think he is a little lackluster. Uh, and it will be, you know, it's hard for him to get to this debate stage in the first place, right? I mean, he struggled to get there. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty telling of where things are right now. I am, you know, glad to see that he is speaking up for Ukraine and, uh, you know, saying that it's important to fund that. So he he still is promoting, you know, the Republican conservative principles um, and amplifying the importance of our position on the global stage. So that's helpful. And, you know, I, we'll see how it plays out because right now it looks like only two members on that stage or two candidates have said that they would not increase funding for Ukraine. But uh, we'll see how that plays out for Pence and others on there. So many different issues that were covered, a lot of chaos that Brett Baer and Martha McCallum were trying to kind of uh, quell there at, at different intervals. Yeah. Uh, but through it all, we got to a couple different issues, some that have played out in the midterm, specifically around abortion. Uh, for both of you uh, females on this panel, I want to get each of yours take because Nikki Haley, I thought, gave a great response to Martha McCallum asking how Republicans actually message around abortion and specifically around the national abortion ban that a lot of other Republican candidates have touted. We all saw Lindsey Graham's press conference on the 15 week uh, mm -hmm. federal abortion ban. So I want to play a little bit of what Nikki Haley said. Get your reaction on the other side. Take a listen to this. Thank you, Martha. I am unapologetically pro-life. Not because the Republican Party tells me to be, 
but because my husband was adopted and I had trouble having both of my children, so I'm surrounded by blessings. Having said that, we need to stop demonizing this issue. This is talking about the fact that unelected justices didn't need to decide something this personal because it's personal for every woman and man. Now it's been put in the hands of the people. That's great. When it comes to a federal ban, let's be honest with the American people and say it will take 60 Senate votes. It will take a majority of the House. So in order to do that, let's find consensus. Can't we all agree that we should ban late-term abortions? Can't we all agree that we should encourage adoptions? Can't we all agree that doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? Can't we all agree that contraception should be available? And can't we all agree that we are not going to put a woman in jail or give her the death penalty if she gets an abortion? Let's treat this like the like a respectful issue that it is and humanize the situation and stop demonizing the situation. So, Marie, her response there, I thought, was incredible, well poised, well thought out. And I think when you're looking at, again, obviously this is the primary season right now, but when you're looking at the national general election, right? And you're talking about that moderate independent voter that wants to hear something like that from somebody on the Republican side of the aisle, what'd you make of Nikki Haley's response? I mean, she's so good on this issue in a bunch of ways, right? And this is the problem with this Republican primary on a number of issues, abortion, climate change, all these other issues, they're being, they think they're being forced to take very far right positions that cannot fly with the general electorate that will hurt them in states like Wisconsin, where they're debating uh, in this first debate. Look, she, she is right on the politics that there's no way to get a federal ban passed, but she's also, you know, Martha asked the question in the right way too. And she said, every time this has been on the ballot since Roe was overturned, Republicans have lost, right? People have, Republican states even have voted to protect abortion. So, you know, Doug Burgum actually was also good on this answer when he said, look, he pulled out his constitution and he said, look at the state's issue. Republicans can't say we want states to decide things. And then when we get in power, say the federal government gets to. That's also a very good conservative answer. I'm not a conservative, but I like that answer if I was. Um, I'll defer, defer to more on that. But, you know, the Republican Party is in deep trouble on the abortion issue, on women's health, on women's issues in general. They are. And Ron DeSantis is among the worst of them. If he thinks he can win a general election talking about women's health the way he does, he is wrong. And and it's it's it is it is stunning to me that Nikki Haley is the only one on that stage who seems to have a sense of the fact that women across America, independent women, Democratic women, some Republican women don't want the government making this decision for them, this very personal decision for them. And that it's not about abortion on demand. It's about the mother in Texas that was suing right now because she almost died because she could not have a medical procedure to save her life. And that's the conversation Democrats want to have, right, coming out of this. That like, this is about health care. This isn't about abortion on demand. And Nikki Haley was good on this. She was good. She is good on this issue. Moore, what would you make not only of Nikki's answer, but the Republican platform right now with respect to abortion? We saw the Ohio special election and how that got shot down. We saw what happened in Kansas, obviously during the midterms. What do you make of the issue and Nikki Haley's response to it? Nikki Haley crushed it. Honestly, she came across with common sense. She was passionate, um, really appealing to women, to independents, but to the people in that room. And, and really, I think, you know, again, humanizing it, as she pointed out. Overall, Marie is right. Republicans will continue to lose if they are so restrictive on the abortion issue and they will never appeal to women. They will never appeal. Even if they're not the loudest voices, women and independence will never get on board with that. And I've always found it to be such a contradictory and hypocritical stance for Republicans to take because it goes against our conservative principles. I am a conservative because I believe in a smaller, more accountable government. There's nothing that says big government, like half, like telling half the population what they can and can't do with their bodies. And I, to me, it's, it's beyond frustrating uh, because again, the Republican party will continue to lose if they don't have a handle on this and, and understand the issue. Um, you know, it's not about whether abortion is right or wrong. I think saying you're pro-life or pro-choice is just inflammatory because the conversation is, and the question is, should the federal government have a say on women's personal freedom? And the unequivocal answer is no, absolutely not. This is why I love, I got to be honest, if if Nick could go away some more often and I could just have you two <laughs> fill in, 
I mean, this is great, great stuff here. Uh, so I, I want to play some more stuff because more issues were covered. Like I said, shout out to Brett and, and Martha for trying to uh, be uh, air traffic control with eight different candidates shouting out different things. Poor Asa Hutchinson couldn't get a word in edgewise. Oh. His campaign manager is probably flipping out. But I want to play one of the exchanges that we were alluding to earlier about climate change and Vivek Ramaswani saying that it was a hoax. I want to play the full sound here, get you guys' reaction on the other side. Take a listen to this. Let me just say to Alexander this. First of all, one of the reasons our country's decline is because of the way the corporate media treats Republicans versus Democrats. Biden was on the beach while those people were suffering. He was asked about it. He said, no comment. Are you kidding me? As somebody that's handled disasters in Florida, you've got to be activated. You've got to be there. You've got to be present. You've got to be helping people who are doing this. And yeah. here's the deal. Yeah. Let's just answer the question. So yeah. here's is the that a yes? Is or is that a yes? Is that a hand raise? You do not. I think it was a hand raise for him, and it's um, my hands are in my pockets. No, because no, no, I didn't raise, change agenda I didn't raise a hand. Let us be honest as Republicans. I'm the only person on the stage who isn't bought and paid for, so I can say this. The climate change oh, agenda whoa, 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 whoa. is a That's hoax. Just ridiculous. The climate this change is agenda is a hoax. Is and we have to declare independence for it. And the reality oh, is the anti-carbon agenda is the wet blanket on our economy. And so the reality is more people are dying of bad climate change policies than they are of actual climate uh, change. Governor. So, ladies, again, a lot of eye rolls here. Six, six eyeballs. Mm -hmm. I have. We have glasses on. Two of us have glasses on. So, hey, ten eye rolls in total. There, um, you heard the answer. The beginning part of it, just for background and context, Ron DeSantis actually said he wanted to answer the question. It was from a viewer that had posed the question about climate change. DeSantis goes into his buzzwords and talking points about you know a President Biden and not being able to show up in Maui lest we forget that he didn't show up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where there was flooding recently in his state. But I digress. Um, Marie, the answer from Vivek there about climate change is a hoax. The exchange with DeSantis, what do you make of it all? Well, first, Martha and Brett asked them to raise their hands if they thought human activity contributed to climate change. No one raised their hands I, that I could see. Ron DeSantis said he wanted to answer the question and then didn't answer the question. And then the only person who answers it says it's a hoax. And then Nikki Haley tries to say something good about China and that was fine. But the the viewer that asked was a, was a conservative young Republican and said, young people care about this issue. So again, you know, young people across the political spectrum, they are sitting in Wisconsin for this debate where it's a hundred degrees, the, one of the hottest days on record and the hottest year on record. Right. We see climate emergencies all over the world. So it's not just Democrats who care about this. Young voters, the fact that they it was like they were it was they were dismissing this this YAF, this Young America's Foundation voter who was asking a serious question. And they responded with these like, you know, these like bingo talking points, like the words they were just pulling out that they put Maui and and China and all this other stuff without addressing this really serious issue. But this is one of those issues where in a general election, if they don't have an answer, if they don't believe climate change is real, if they don't believe we have to do something, we don't have to agree on what to do, there's a huge percentage of voters who are just gonna be, they just won't reach. And it just, it was a clown show. That answer was a clown show. It, it was just, it was, I, that was one of the worst answers of the night, I think. Moore, you're steeped in Republican politics. You just, for the last 12 years on Capitol Hill, uh, tell me a little bit about the exchange first off, but then also the issue, you, like like Marie just mentioned, it was a young conservative voter that is saying, hey, this is something pressing, right? Because we all live on this planet and it's getting hotter. The sea levels are rising. So what do you make of the exchange and then the Republican messaging around it and these different candidates that are having different messages and one of them saying it, it's a hoax? I think it made both DeSantis and Vivek Ramachami pretty look look pretty childish, quite frankly. Um, you know, and maybe that was the the objective there with the others not raising their hand or chiming in because these two were looking so foolish that they're like, well, let them have it. Uh, so I'm not sure if that was the strategy behind it for the other candidates on stage not to chime in while those two are making fools of themselves. But it's going to continue to be an issue for Republicans if they continue to deny climate change. Uh, you know, that this is the reality that we're in. And 
again, these are young people's issues that they care about and that they're looking to vote on. So many young people are not registering or identifying as Republican or Democrat. So you really do need to think about the issues that they're focused on. This is who Republicans need to try and get on board and obviously Democrats as well, but they are certainly not going to do so if they continue to ignore the reality of the wildfires. What happened with, you know, with Canada coming down and the orange smoke that filled New York City and places across the country, and it's still going to happen. It's still happening. You know, things like that that are uh, really impacting lives here and and to ignore it is doing not only us, the voters, a disservice, but it's, it's beyond uh, repair, I think, for some of these candidates. Because... These young voters remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's doing the planet a disservice. We all live here. You know, we got to do something yeah. about this. Um, ladies, one big thing, uh, as as we were recording this and, and the debate was wrapping up, one big thing that was started trending on Twitter, and we all know the elephant in the room was actually not in the room. He was doing a pre-recorded interview with Tucker Carlson, which aired uh, simulcast on Twitter at the same time as the debates. And during the debates, there was questions to the different candidates about the former president, the charges that he's facing across the four different jurisdictions, New York, Georgia, Florida, and D.C. And then a question came to former Vice President Mike Pence uh, asking him about would he pardon President Trump if he became leader of the free world. I want you guys to listen to the exchange. We're going to react on the other side. Take a listen to this. Why don't you say this? Join me yeah. in making a commitment well that on day one, you would pardon Donald Trump. I'm the only candidate on the stage who had the courage to actually say it. That's that is how we move our nation forward I don't know and turn the page forward. That That's exactly Trump right. will be convicted of these crimes. You should make, be able to make a commitment, the same oh. justice system that was this that corrupt. the difference between you and, and me. Yeah, I, I'm not a professional actually, politician. That's I've the difference actually, who can answer uh, a question. I've actually given pardons. When I was governor of the state of Indiana, it usually follows a finding of guilt and contrition by the individual that's been convicted. So, we'll look, we'll, if I'm president of the United States, we'll give fair consideration to any pardon request. But if I may. At- so, I mean, that's interesting in itself. First off, he is right, uh, Vice President Pence, about the way it works, right? First, you have to be found guilty. In our last episode, uh, former uh, DOJ prosecutor and CNN legal analyst Ellie Honig was on the show, and we talked a little bit about the Georgia indictments, uh, could Trump be found guilty, actually serve any jail time, uh, the different cases, and how prosecutors shouldn't be looking to pardon-proof their cases, right, based on that. Well, here the candidates are being asked, should they pardon somebody? And nothing has even happened yet. These cases haven't even set trial. One's looking to start in potentially 2026 if the motion is approved. Marie, what do you make of the exchange? And then the question overall about, Will you pardon the former president if he's found guilty? And the answers and responses from each of those candidates up there on stage. Well, I think Vivek is clearly running to be the Trumpiest of these folks. Like, if you don't really love Trump or if he gets in hot, you know, more hot water legally, I'm your guy. And he was trying so hard to be his defender. And we can't forget that tomorrow, uh, you know, the day after the debate, I should say, um, Trump is going to take up all the oxygen too, because he is going to turn himself in. I think he's doing it in prime time, right? Like he, he, these cases uh, loom so large, but the idea that these candidates would be talking about whether to pardon him when he is, has 91 criminal indictments against him. I mean, this is like, I'm not a Republican voter. I feel like I don't know how to answer this question. I want, I can't wait to hear what Maura has to say, because in my mind, I keep thinking there have to be Republican voters who kind of like his policies and like some of the things he says, but like 91 indictments feels like a lot. So I, I, I keep thinking that there will be a moment when at some point, and we see it in polling, a lot of Republicans are open to someone else, right? There's a lot of Republicans who are, who are open-minded still, but I just don't understand how they are falling all over each other. Yeah. Many of them, not Pence though. Pence was, Pence was, you know, kept his cards a little close to his vest there, I think, because he lived through January 6th and he was under threat and attack. Um, But I just, you know, this is one place where I can't figure out the Republican electorate, so I need more to explain it to me. Well, and (laughs) more is going to explain it to us. But more. I know, I know. (laughs) What do you make of what do you make of the exchange? First off, what do you make of, again, the elephant in the room, not being in the actual room as well to not debating and how he really is going to suck up 
the air and coverage of this debate as he turns himself in for the fourth time now in a different jurisdiction. What do you make of it all? Glad to hear Pence push back on Vivek and explain to him how pardons work and what that actually means, because to not only offer pardon, as he pointed out, you have to be guilty, but also to accept that pardon, you are accepting guilt. And that would be what Trump would be doing, would be accepting guilt. And so that that's a side sidebar situation. But I think, you know, when it comes to how they're not addressing Trump or how they are and what he is doing as far as taking all the oxygen in the room or attempting to take all the attention by having his uh, primetime uh, Georgia Fulton County jail um, arrival. Uh, you know, I think what, what one thing I would like to point out, and I wish that more people on the stage would do this, or would have done this, is Donald Trump is actively working against the Republican Party. He has refused to sign the pledge. He's not showing up to these debates. The debates are for the voters so that they can identify, okay, who is best suited for what policies I want to see for going forward? Who is the candidate that I most align with? You know, And by not doing that, he's basically saying that he doesn't have to earn the votes of, of the Republican primary voters. And to me, if somebody is going to go there and basically attack the party and not want to be part of it, doesn't that go against and thinks he's better that it doesn't need to to earn the votes, doesn't that go against what the whole MAGA mentality is, is about draining the swamp of entitled leaders? You know, you know so I, I don't see how they can't make that connection there. There's so many ways to chip the armor of Donald Trump that I wish more candidates, um, and maybe going forward they will, but they really need to because they need to point out to the electorate how bad he is for our party because, again, we will continue to lose if he is at the top of the ticket. I encourage both of you to go to our Instagram page and see the last clip of social media that we did on this show and how many comments we got from Trump supporters about the different cases in Georgia. I encourage you after we finish recording, take your time, scroll more. I know you got TV in the morning, but when you when you've got a chance on the on the drive back uh, and take a look and then you tell me if these people are reasonable uh, before I let you both go. And I can't thank you both enough for joining me on the program today. Uh, who do you guys think, Gal, excuse me, think uh, made the biggest bump of the night? Because that's going to be the talking point over the next couple of days uh, after this debate is long and gone and in the annals of history of primary debates. Who do you think will get the biggest bump off of all of it? Marie, uh, I'll start with you first. Oh, no, you're starting with me. Uh... No, all right. We'll start with Maura. Maura first. <laughs> yeah, start with Maura. Start with Maura. Yeah. Maura. Okay, Maura, who sure. Do you think? So I think Nikki Haley, like I said, I think she crushed it. And I think she really did put herself in a position uh, to gain some voters and to gain, especially with women and, and independents, because she came across strong, competent, polished, and pretty, you know, straightforward. I, I thought she seemed common sense and, and smart in her responses. Uh, so I think she'll get a bump. I also was impressed with Doug Burgum. I think, you know, I, I do. I think given what happened to him and his injury, he still showed up, um, you know, the, that's strength. And I think when you contrast that with Donald Trump, who chose not to show up to the debate because he didn't want to answer the tough questions, that makes him look weak. Whereas Doug Burgum has torn his Achilles tendon and he is on stage. And I think he answered some of these questions pretty well and really did get to introduce himself a little bit. You know, it was hard probably with all the other uh, candidates bickering, but I think he really did, you know, kind of present himself as an adult in the room uh, and willing to to be common sense and, and refer back to his North Dakota, you know, small town uh, policies and feel um, that maybe, you know, will really appeal to folks in the Midwest as well um, as throughout the country. So those are my two takeaways. Obviously, I appreciated Christy kind of throwing some jabs there at Vivek and putting him in his place as a small little, you know, petulant child, essentially. But uh, so those are my two takeaways. <laughs> Marie, what about you as a Midwest girl, uh, Indiana girl yourself? Give yes. me give me some of uh, what you thought uh, of who will get the biggest bump off of all this. So I agree with Maura. I think Nikki Haley did a really good job. And we haven't talked about it here tonight, but on Ukraine, you know, there was there's a real policy difference on Ukraine. And she is very strong on Ukraine, as are some of the other candidates. But I think she did. I think she did a really good job. I think she did a good job at her CNN town hall a few months ago. I, I think. I think she's very polished and I think common sense was a term you use more and I really liked it. I look, I don't like to say this. I think Vivek may get a bump here. I think he might. I don't want him to. Um, I hope he doesn't, but I think he performed. He's a performer. He's like a carnival barker. And I, I think I suspect he might. My my losers of the night, I mean, Ron DeSantis did not look like a front runner, did not look like presidential material. 
you know, I had high hopes for Tim Scott. I like Tim Scott. I, uh, I like his, his, his place in this, in this contest, in this campaign. And I had hoped he would be more of the happy warrior, but sort of a tough, happy warrior. And he was kind of a non-entity, which, which I was a little disappointed in uh, as well. So, and Pence, Pence is the other one who is on my loser column for, for the debate, because a lot of people, I think, are impressed with how he's gone after Trump, how he's gone after him on January 6th, and what he did on January 6th. And tonight it was like the old Mike Pence. And, you know, that's not what I think some people hoped showed up. So so those are my winners and losers. I love it. You know, ladies, one thing I, I've mentioned a bunch on this program as somebody that was tuned into the 2015 debates, you know, there was a stand-up comic who would close the show like a Dave Chappelle, Jerry Seinfeld. He hit the talking points. He had the charisma. Little Marco Rubio, Lion Ted Cruz. You're having trouble hearing tonight, Rand Paul. And that guy was Donald Trump. And the person making sense that would always go right after him was Ohio Governor John Kasich. And I feel the same way about Vivek Ramaswani and the way he was able to be charismatic, get some cheers, get some jeers, try to do some things that clearly are stolen from other people's playbooks. And then right after that, the adult that's going in the room that's answering it sometimes was Nikki Haley, Doug Burgum. We'll see what happens with the rest of uh, the debate season. But to me, I think Vivek will get at least a little bit of a bump from this because people see how charismatic he is. Once we start drilling into policy, we'll see how that translates, right? Because people like me, I want to hear more about policy. And I don't hear that from him. I hear climate change is a hoax. So does that resonate? We'll find out. I can't thank my panel enough tonight <laughs> and Nick Savary for going on vacation. More or less, <laughs> former uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, Representative Adam Kinzinger. Marie Harfart, Fox News contributor. Thank you so much to the two of you for coming on the program. Continue success to both of you and stay safe. Thank you. It's great. Hey, thanks for watching the Can We Please Talk podcast. Whatever clip you just watched, we hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you stick around for some more. Subscribe to the channel. My partner's over here smashing the button. Come on, do me a favor. So hit subscribe.